Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex today. We have a very important and interesting guest that's going to be coming on in just a minute or so. It's Dr. William Pepper. Now, Dr. Pepper is a human rights law advocate. He is a barrister from the United Kingdom, admitted to the bar in numerous jurisdictions throughout the United States. Now, he was involved in the televised trial of James Earl Ray. It was a mock trial to attempt to get Ray the trial that he never had. And he's also been involved in a recent trial trying to get a retrial for Sirhan Sirhan, filing motions to get a retrial based on new evidence that has surfaced as recently as within the last 10 years. There's been a lot of evidence that's surfaced about that. So we're going to talk to him about that, as well as cases that are breaking now. One thing I want to get his opinion on, and this is a breaking piece of news, the judges who preside over America's secret court... This is out of Reuters. It says 12 of the 14 judges who have served this year on the most secret court in America are Republicans. Half are former prosecutors. What we're seeing here with the FISA court, we're, we're told not to worry about all these releases of NSA snooping because it's all been authorized by these judges. Well, it turns out that they fly them in for a short period of time. They're actually working on, as, as regular judges in their jurisdiction, they fly them in from time to time, they do a cursory review of this stuff, and just say, go ahead and do it. There's not any sense of a reasonable cause when you give the government permission to look at the phone information for millions of American customers. Don't tell me that they did any kind of an investigation about that. So what we're going back to is we're, we're kind of overthrowing the rule of law and the overthrow of things like star chambers. We're going back to things that are we'd hope we'd left behind in the dark ages. And so I'd like to get Dr. Pepper's uh, comment about that. Dr. Pepper, thank you for joining us today. It's good to be with you. What do you think about that? What do you think of the secret courts that we're told that we don't have anything to worry about because uh, all these FISA uh, releases are being overseen by a judge? And so, in a secret court, so they've okayed that, and we're not allowed to see those decisions. What the basis of that was, but we should be reassured that we have judges, even though they're secret, looking over this stuff. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think the basis of uh, of, of any democracy is uh, is accountability, and ultimately accountability to the people. And one of the problems with secrecy of any kind, and including the deliberations that go before the FISA courts, is that the uh, uh, the, the people are not uh, 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 given the opportunity to understand uh, the underlying basis and reason for, as you did say, the uh, the decisions that are being made. When you have a, a situation where you, uh, as we we did have in America, and in, in my view, this is not the country I grew up in, um, you had a, a separation of powers that meant something, where there was a a, a, a crossover in terms of checks and balances, and um, uh, we're, we're moving further and further away from that. And I think uh, you're quite right into a more secretive society. And the, the FISA courts, are, um, which have been around for, for some time now, are only uh, one example of the, the movement toward secrecy and the unaccountability uh, of the government, particularly the executive. And if you had a Congress that was um, willing to to look at the, the actions of the executive, and and here you have to understand the executive uh, uh, acts also by executive order, and those executive orders so many people in the United States don't even know anything about. And, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yet yet the last two uh, presidents have uh, exhibited a great tendency to rule by executive uh, executive order. So we don't have congressional accountability. Um, despite a lot of the bluff and the bluster that goes on over nothing, really. And right. major issues are, are just ignored. So I think um, the people should be aware, and I think people should be concerned, and, uh, and look to uh, trying to reestablish the rule of law in an accountable way. What do you think about the parallels to the Nixon impeachment when we look at what Obama has done? To me... It's amazing the parallels, the, the nature of what he was accused of, basically using the IRS against enemies, wiretapping people. We see the same things happening with the Obama administration, but the magnitude and the extent of it are so much greater. And yet there's absolutely no talk about impeachment from either party. Well, I, I, I mean, he's, <laughs> this guy 
is in league with the ruling forces of the society. Right. And they can they control, they dominate the Congress, and they control the uh, the whole process of, of impeachment. And that's exactly uh, what you were saying in the beginning. You, you said that this is not the country that you grew up in, because when Nixon was around, at least there was some checks and balances going on from one branch to the other. The Congress would actually stand up and say something about some of these illegal actions, whereas today they just are complicit and go along with it. Well, yeah, you don't have any any devotion to the Constitution, no. really, with few exceptions. But I'm going to say there are some exceptions, but with few exceptions, the uh, the Constitution seems to be capable of being uh, uh, ameliorated, uh, pushed aside, all in the name of this new war, this war on terror. And now they're moving this uh, the, <laughs> the fear of terrorism very clearly into the domestic side of things. You know, foreign terrorists were the major concern uh, after 9-11. Well, we've crossed that bridge, and we're now involved with uh, concern about domestic terrorism. And, uh, and I think the number of war games that the Pentagon has, uh, has slated, and they're available on the Pentagon's website, uh, are, are indicative of the fact that they are uh, now gearing up for a uh, massive crackdown. Absolutely. Uh, and I think it's going to ultimately lead to a suppression of all dissent. I think that's where it's heading. We've talked uh, over and over again on this show about how they have set up war games, as you, as you mentioned it, in various cities where they go in and they have joint exercises between the military and the police. And it's being done on an increasing basis, increasingly frequent basis. Part of it is getting people accustomed to that. But the other part of it is, as they said, they like to train in a scenario that they're going to be engaged in. So when you see them in American cities working with the police, you can understand that they're not training for the invasion of Syria because they don't think that they're going to get the cooperation of the police in Syria. They're training for domestic oppression. That's what they're training in with these different exercises. Don't you believe that? Well, yeah, they, they, they've been at this for a long time. The militarization yes. of the police has been going on uh, for well over 35 years. It's been gradual. Mm -hmm. They've been infiltrated by uh, intelligence agencies and, uh, and, and the Defense Department. And uh, I, I think it's virtually complete at this point in time. And the Americans, it's happening right under their noses. Unfortunately, yeah. they don't know. And maybe don't want to know. There's a whole psychological mindset that I think you have to be very conscious of and aware of. And it's, a, it, it's very easy for citizens in a republic like this uh, to go into a situation of denial where they really, they just don't want to know. And that's, that is what's most frightening to me, because mm -hmm. the only two roads to power and change are money and numbers. Since the uh, we know who controls the money. Uh, the numbers are the only route available. And uh, if you don't have a mobilized population, as the uh, uh, Occupy movement it, it, uh, in its you know in its infancy attempted to uh, to establish, um, you, we're in deep trouble here. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I'd like to talk to you about is the Sirhan Sirhan case because that is something that just came up recently. And you're trying to get a new trial for Sirhan, Sirhan, based on evidence there. It's a fascinating case that's there. But I guess part of it that fascinates me is the fact, and, and I really respect what you've done, because when you stand up against something that is the narrative of the mainstream media, like the case of Sirhan, Sirhan, you get called conspiracy theorists. You get ridiculed. And yet, it's not an open and shut case. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, I and my colleague, Laurie Dusik, um, agreed to take on um, the Sirhan uh, uh, habeas corpus petition after his, uh, his then-current lawyer, uh, Larry Cheater, died. Um, uh, we didn't do it, I didn't do it quickly, and I didn't do it um, surreptitiously uh, or frivolously um, because of the, exactly what you say. I have to be very careful. I, I try to be very careful about getting involved in, in, in causes and fights because uh, if it's not well, if your fight is not well grounded, if your position is not uh, substantial, you do get attacked. And if you make a mistake along the way, and no matter how small or minor, that of course will be magnified. So you really do have to be, when you're coming up against the forces involved in these 
kinds of cases, and I'm talking about political assassinations. You really do have to be very careful. And I studied that file for a better part of a couple of years and, and before I finally agreed to do it. Remember, when I agreed to represent James Earl Ray, I had taken 10 years of working on that case before I agreed to represent James, who was after me for a long time to do it, yeah. because I wanted to be absolutely certain that he, had, he played, not only did he not do it, but he played no knowing role. Mm -hmm. in the assassination of Martin King. So uh, I started in 78. It was 88 before I took him on. With respect to Sirhan, we came on in, uh, around 2007, I guess, after we really went, went carefully through the file. Now, this was a particularly important case for me personally because, as I knew Martin King the last year of his life and was very close to him during that period when I was uh, much younger and I'd come back as a journalist from Vietnam, I also... Um, knew Bobby uh, Kennedy. I was his citizen's chairman when he ran for the Senate in New York State in 1964 in Westchester County. I, w I ran his campaign, and and I was though I was very young, I had a fairly large uh, following of, of reform. Hang people. on, Dr. Pepper. We're gonna we're gonna continue. I want to hear the rest of this, and I know everybody's gonna want to hear about the Sirhan Sirhan case because it's not an open and shut case, as we've been yeah, told. Hang on, we'll be right at, back after the break. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because Today, we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter, and in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Dr. William Pepper. We had a trial for the Martin Luther King assassination, the trial that James Earl Ray never got. And just recently, he has moved for a retrial of Sirhan Sirhan based on some new evidence that turned up in 2004. And it's very interesting to see that it, it may take a very long time. As he mentioned just before the break, he spent 10 years investigating the Martin Luther King assassination before he decided to take the case. Even though he was in touch with the Martin Luther King family, they had questions about the story as presented by the government and, of course, there had never been a trial because James Earl Ray pled guilty so that he would not get the death penalty. And it takes a long time for the truth to come out. We're just learning this week that a new documentary is coming out about the Oklahoma, about the Flight 800, the TWA Flight 800, that happened about 17 years ago, blew up in midair, had a lot of witnesses say that they saw a missile. They saw something that looked like flares going out and up to the plane and then exploding in the plane. We had transcriptions of pilots talking to the air traffic control saying the similar thing. We had the FBI going around and confiscating data from people. Now we've got six whistleblowers who are probably now retired and want to get the truth out. We saw the same thing with the Oklahoma City bombing with a noble lie. And now we have a documentary that is coming out from InfoWars. We're going to have that exclusively here at InfoWarsShop.com. And that is State of Mind. And it talks about mind control and how that's been around for quite some time. And that actually plays a part in the Sirhan Sirhan story. Tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Pepper. Right. Well, I mean, we can go through the, the litany of evidence in the Sirhan case. See? Um, uh, we, we became convinced that he is, uh, was totally and is act, actually innocent uh, of the assassination and was used as a patsy. Um, we had initially suspected that there was uh, some 
um, mind control activity at work um, because of his his failure to remember very critical events in the in the pantry uh, consistently historically over the years, which would in fact have uh, enabled him uh, to uh, to explain what was happening. So what we we one of the things we did was to bring in Doctor. Uh, Dr. Daniel Brown from uh, from Harvard, who is a, a specialist in um, and hypnoprogramming. Hypnoprogramming doesn't mean uh, hypnotism alone. It's the use of chemicals and drugs in combination with right. hypnosis. And this is something that and the that, CIA has admitted to be to doing since the at least the 60s, going back to the 50s. Oh, actually, with Frank Olson, involved. it was already well into it. He died sometime in the 1950s. Yeah, they've been they've been involved in this tactic for quite a long period of time, right? And and have developed it uh, with, with a degree of sophistication. Dan spent over seventy hours, uh, a period over a period of three years and seven seventy uh, seventy different um, uh, sessions with with Sirhan, and we have filed his m massive report and opinion and affidavit, and it's pretty clear that. Sirhan was, in fact, um, put through a, a two-week mind control session hmm. at a specific clinic. Now, um, he, he, Sirhan claims that he doesn't remember shooting. Actually, he thought he was at a shooting range. Is that yes, correct? Yes. Yeah, they, this is what they had programmed him to, uh, to recall, that he had been at a shooting range that afternoon, and they, they, he was programmed on, on cue, which was a pinch on the neck for the handler. The handler was a... Uh, a woman uh, who um, attached herself to him in the hotel and went into the pantry and sat with him and effectively controlled him. He, is, he was used prim well, fundamentally just to distract. He was used to uh, on the pinch to get up and see a, a target, uh, a shooting range target in front of him, and then begin to pull the trigger. Um, he, he, <laughs> he got off two shots. And then he was swamped, and his hand was pinned to the table. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, we have we have six eyewitnesses who saw him being pinned to the table after the arm to the table after the second shot. So he he, he kept pulling the trigger robotically, uh, with but his hand was on the table, and the bullets were careening all over the, the pantry. Meanwhile, the actual assassin put three bullets at powder burn range into the back of Senator Kennedy. Uh, two into his, through his coat and one through his right ear, which which uh, into the brain, which killed him, mm. and that that was the, that was the fatal shot. A fourth shot went through uh, his shoulder pad. So four shots were fired from the rear. Sirhan was never in the uh, toward the rear. He was always in front of the senator. I mean, we have twelve witnesses, eyewitnesses who independently always placed him in front of the center, never behind Amazing, it. amazing uh, revelation. Yeah, We're going to continue on with that. It's extraordinary. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happened. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and I'm talking to Dr. William Pepper. And he's trying to get a retrial for Sirhan Sirhan, the accused killer of Robert Kennedy. And we were talking just before the break about how Sirhan Sirhan maintains, and Dr. Pepper's had testimony from expert psychologists, he maintains that he was under mind control, that he did not know where he was or what he was doing. He believed that he was shooting at a target range. And Dr. Pepper was just telling us before the break that he only got two shots off and then people around him pinned his hand to the table and he continued to fire until he fired all eight shots and he fired randomly into the crowd of spectators there. Meanwhile, Robert Kennedy was killed with three shots from behind at point blank range, as Dr. Pepper puts it, powder burn range. And uh, we, he was just telling us about some of the details about that. This is not just assertions. Think about how this was played in the media. 
Think about how they focused on the open and shut case. Here we have a person shooting Robert Kennedy as he's walking through the hotel lobby, and we've got it all on videotape, and here's what we saw, and they just tell you what they saw, and they don't talk about the fact that witnesses pinned his hand to the, to the table after just two shots. They just maintain that that's the truth. It's a consistent story across the media because they only had uh, three different networks. Now I guess you could say we've got basically one network that's telling the same story. People hear the same story every channel they turn to, so that's evidently the truth. But it's not, is it, Dr. Pepper? No, it's certainly not the truth. The, uh, the corporate media is not going to reveal uh, kind of the truthful facts about these kinds of cases because the government is involved. And uh, they're they will continue and perpetuate the cover up to the extent that they can uh, for as long as they possibly can. You know, Bernstein, Carl Bernstein, alerted us to the fact that there were over 400 intelligence agents spread throughout all of the media in America in, in very senior positions as well as, as, uh, as stringers. And um, they, they, they make a point of, uh, of uh, influencing what goes in and what stays out. And uh, the, the masses are not going to. Uh, be told that what now, really has happened. There was some new evidence that came out in 2004. Tell us about that audio tape. Yeah, there was a uh, there was an audio uh, a tape it was a tape recorder that was was running by a it's called the Brzezinski tape by a, uh, um, a a a journalist researcher who was there, and <clears throat> it. it it had been known from the beginning, and it was a part of the archival evidence. But there, it was not possible to do the the kind of very uh, pre precise analysis of the sounds on that tape. On uh, it, it really uh, that technology only developed in the in the in the middle of the 2000s, 2005, 2006. And, and we were able to get a, a computerized uh, analysis of the sounds on the tape, and it indicated that 13 bullets, they identified 13 bullets as having been fired. They were, the 13 bullets were fired from two different directions, west to east and east to west. Sirhan was firing east to west. Bullets came the other way from west to east. Uh, there, were, there were two different types of guns they were both 22 calibers but there was there were there was a, a, a slightly different it's amazing and uh, that they can they can detail it's a sort of like a radiological um, a difference in the weapons that were fired and there were some overlapping shots which means when Sirhan fired his first uh, the two shots and then the balance from the table kept pulling the trigger there were there were um, uh, like shots three, four, for example, were o of the 13 were overlapping. So it was very clear there were two guns being fired in the pantry at that time. And that, of course, uh, backs up the, uh, the, the truth that Bob Kennedy was killed uh, from the rear with bullets fired in a slightly upward angle with a gun virtually pressed against his body. Now, there was Someone also was some... Behind him. There was also some uh, physical evidence about the bullets being fired at an upward angle, too, wasn't there? Wasn't there some bullets that went into the ceiling or something like that? that... Yeah, there were bullets. There were, there were shots that, that went over and up, up, up into the, uh, into, into the uh, dropped ceiling uh, level. And um, the one that went through um, Bob's um, shoulder pad was, you know, was an upward, was another upward shot. There were four upward shots fired, three of which from behind him, three of which... Uh, 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 did hit, hit him. So this is the kind of evidence and the kind of analysis, uh, in, in some cases, either was not available or was not presented uh, to, to the jury at the time. So we believe that there is a legitimate claim under law for, uh, um, for Sirhan to be given, well, we think he should be turned loose, frankly, mm -hmm. because of the, uh, there were two of the, two of the bullets that were introduced in evidence were not the real fatal bullets. We've established that as well. They were not bullets that, that, were, uh, that were fired from Sirhan's gun. So uh, the evidence is so strong that we think uh, actual evidence is, uh, actual innocence is clear, 
and then, and if he's not going to turn him loose, of course, but as, as we would hope they would give him a new trial. If they won't give him a new trial, we would hope at least we can get, at least we can get an evidentiary hearing where for the first time all of this new evidence can be put out and, and, and uh, under oath. That's really what we would like to see happen. It's a man who's been in prison, as you, you can imagine, for all of these years and uh, for a crime that, uh, that he didn't commit. That's right. You might even consider doing a documentary. I mean, when we go back and look at the Oklahoma City bombings, the noble lie went back and talked to so many eyewitnesses and put together so much information. I was aware of a lot of what had been discovered at the time that it happened. I was following it. I knew about the bomb blast patterns not matching and being testified to that by a former general who was a demolitions expert, not matching the kind of blast pattern that you would have from a single bomb, single point source. There was a lot of information like that that it was pretty clear that it didn't match the official story. There was, like I said about Flight 800, we had a lot of eyewitnesses talking about seeing flares, identifying it as a missile, as a cruise missile, surface-to-air missile. But in each of these cases, we see that the FBI is going around and not only, not just not doing an investigation, but actually taking evidence away. And, and so that's why I think part of this, uh, part of the Sirhan story as we point out, involves mind control. And that's something that people have kind of laughed off as conspiracy theories or science fiction. That's one thing. But as you said, and as we know, and as this documentary, State of the Mind, is going to point out, it is very well documented. This has been going on for a very long time. It was in the 1950s that Frank Olson died at the, as we believe, at the hands of the CIA, as his family maintains. And he was part of mind control experiments at that time in the mid fifties that have been going on for quite some time. So, I think it's very important. Maybe you might consider doing a documentary to get the story out. Well, I'm, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm happy to cooperate with people who, who want to do documentaries on sure. these kinds of cases. Sure. Uh, but I've got to uh, you know keep my eye on the issues and. And do what um, you know. What, what, what a, a human rights lawyer should do: try to uh, to, uh, to right a wrong, rectify an injustice, and uh, and that's, uh, that's oh, absolutely that's a, pr a pretty big task in itself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I understand. You're not a filmmaker. You're a lawyer, and and you do what you do very well. And we really appreciate you standing up and standing up for the truth. Now, you've got a new trial that is coming up that you wanted to talk about that you've just started as well. Can you tell us about that? Well, it's it's um, it's it's in early, it's in the early stages yet, and it's uh, uh, yes, it's a work uh, of a man who uh, by the name Peter Jenny, who uh, has published a book called Mary's Mosaic. Peter worked for worked for about thirty five years on that case. Um, the Mary in it is is Mary Meyer. Now, the fascinating thing about this case it's a uh, it's a fifty year old case. She was. She was assassinated in 1964 in Washington, D.C. She was the only woman Jack Kennedy ever loved and was very, very close to him, and it's quite clear he was going to marry her. I mean, people close to them knew that and, would, and said that after the second term. Mary had been married, she's a very prominent Washington person, had been married uh, to uh, Cord Meyer, who was a deputy director of the CIA, and she just had so much of of their operations that she couldn't take it, and she and she divorced him. Um, and then she became close to Jack Kennedy, and they really had a mission for peace. She was about turning him into uh, a, a a real a fighter, a warrior, if you will, for peace. And Jack Kennedy, as you know, delivered a famous speech in, at American University, and began to turn directly in that issue. She, it was beyond that. I mean, she went to, she got Tim Leary up at Harvard to uh, uh, give her acid, and she took the president, uh, believe it or not, on, uh, on his only acid trip to try to open <laughs> him up. And and I think she was very successful and very much in love. And as Peter Janney has d documented so well in his book and his work, um, she came to a point when they assassinated Jack Kennedy. Uh, she knew how it happened, and she waited for the Warren Commission report to come out. That report was a, it was a total cover-up, as many people believe. Oh, yeah. She confronted her, her ex-husband, Gord Meyer, 
and, uh, and, and said that quite clearly she was going to blow the whistle on, on him and Jim Angleton and the agency because of their involvement in the assassination if they didn't allow the truth to come forward about how Jack was killed. Well, I'm, you know, this is a brave and courageous and marvelous woman. And um, frankly, they, they then assassinated her. They killed her on a towpath when she went for a daily walk in, uh, outside of her home in, in Georgetown. They, uh, they, they had her assassinated. Mm. They set up a black guy, uh, Ray Crump. They tried, they tried him, and a, a wonderful, talented lawyer named uh, W. Roundtree got him him acquitted because they didn't have the evidence they didn't have any, any forensics any fibers any they had no evidence and a, a witness saw someone allegedly this was a part of the staging standing over the body was five foot eight inches tall 185 pounds crump was about five three 135 pounds <laughs> i mean it was it was it was ludicrous so the jury um and that's why we love the jury system, isn't it? You know, yeah. they, they acquitted this guy. So it's been an unsolved murder to this point in time. And but Peter Janney has identified a key person who was involved in that conspiracy. And yes, he uh, apparently was an intelligence agent. He was there. He was on the scene. Um, and he was used. And we are looking at a way... And it's not easy, as you can imagine, in, you know, uh, after 50 years. But we're looking at a way to try to bring this into a courtroom where all of the evidence that Peter has uncovered can be put um, before a judge and jury. And I took this on. I've watched Peter's work for a number of years and advised him to stay in the background. Finally agreed to do it, to come on as his counsel, because I came to see that this is um, maybe the most important of the assassinations because it links. Mm -hmm. It links to the assassination of Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy because she was, of course, involved uh, in, in discussions with the, with the two of them in terms of all kinds of matters. She visited the White House 40 times in, Octo in the October before the president was killed in, in November. Wow. So she's a very powerful behind-the-scenes uh, influence uh, to combat the Cold War and to bring America away from the Cold War into a, in, into a peaceful perspective. And, of course, that's one of the things that was held against John Kennedy, that he was looking to normalize relations with Cuba, or that he had, uh, he had entered into serious discussions with Khrushchev. Well, you talk, uh, about, the, you talk about Kennedy's peace movements. He actually stopped Operations, Operation Northwoods, which is really kind of oh, a yes. template oh, for 9-11. Yeah. If people want to know why we believe, one of the reasons why we believe it is because they had planned it decades before, doing oh, exactly yeah. no. the same he, thing. He, he walked out of the room. One time after another, the Joint Chiefs came at him. Curtis LeMay and, and Lemnitzer came at him. They wanted, a, they wanted a preemptive strike on the Soviet Union. Yeah. A nuclear strike. Yeah. I mean, one thing after another, these these uh, these military guys were uh, on Kennedy, and when he questioned them specifically and precisely about detail, they didn't have them. They didn't know that there were a hundred uh, 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 land-based surface missiles uh, throughout Cuba. Mm. They didn't even know that. And if, and if there had been the invasion that they were looking to mount, it would have been a disaster. Uh, for, yeah. for mainland United States as well as for oh, any absolutely. invading force. Absolutely. Yeah, for people I mean, who don't know, I mean, look at Operations Northwoods. That was a, a plan to fly planes into buildings and blame it on yeah, Cuba yeah. so they could have an excuse to attack Cuba. It was a plan yeah, right. to do bombs in civilian areas, a campaign of terrorism so they could blame it on Cuba and then invade That's Cuba. Exactly right. And when limits are... Exactly right. When Limitzer was let go by Kennedy, he goes to NATO, and you see in NATO, you see Operation Gladio, where they had a campaign of terror there that they then turned around and blamed on the communists so they could move their agenda forward there. Well, there's no question about that. You know, and if Bob Kennedy uh, had been elected president, it was, he had made it, although on the, on the record and officially, he, he never uh, made this commitment, but he did to... Uh, uh, to some of who were very close to him, uh, and he did say he did, one of his first tasks was going to be to reopen the investigation of the 
assassination of its brother. And in that, it was a, it was a, that's a collaboration right across with, you know, with the encouragement, of course, of Mary Meyer. So I, I think this is a political assassination. People don't know about it. It's an unsolved murder. And uh, I applaud Peter Janney for all of his work, and I'm happy to do what I can do to bring those facts to light because they relate to the other critical assassinations uh, on, on either side of uh, her death. And, yes, um, yes. And I'm happy to do that. Well, you know, it's always a worthwhile thing to go in and search for the truth. And I really appreciate the fact that, as you said, you, you made sure that you had careful evidence. You went in and you looked for 10 years at the Martin Luther King assassination before you went into it. So we don't want to go in half-cocked about stuff, and we don't want to start throwing around wild accusations, but when you see something that's not right, when you see something that doesn't match the official story, it takes a lot of courage to go against that and to stand up and point out the emperor has no clothes, to say that this isn't true, that you know, here's what really happened, even, especially when it's something like in the case of Sirhan Sirhan, where he talks about having been under mind control. The public is really not ready to accept that on a broad basis yet. We have a lot of education to do because, as we both said, this has been going on for over 60 years, and they've turned it into something of a science. This is something that the CIA, as well as other black ops, have been doing for quite a long time. We're going to be right back with Dr. William Pepper right after the break. Stay tuned. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, filling in for Alex here in Austin. A little bit of housekeeping before we go back to our guest, Dr. William Pepper. Infidel Body Armor at InfidelBodyArmor.com. Take a look at their product. It stops hundreds of rounds of AK-47, M4, 3060, 308, and more. It's ceramic armor. Just stops six rounds, but this goes beyond that. This stops hundreds of rounds. It's related to Level 3 Body Armor. And that number is 888-608-6605. That's 888-608-6605. And as we were talking about at the beginning of the hour, this amazing case out of Tennessee where just complaining about cloudy, bad-tasting water to the water board caused them to threaten the complainers with terrorism. Not just calling them loony, not just calling them conspiracy theorists, but threatening them and saying, you know, you better be careful. We might talk to Homeland Security about you. We might uh, out you as a terrorist. Well, you may not be able to get the bureaucrats to do anything to clean up the water, but you can take control of it yourself to some degree. If you live in an area like we do here in Austin where they dump a lot of garbage into the water, fluoride and other things, you can get a pro-pure filter. You can get that at InfoWarsStore.com. You can get 10% off. It's gravity filtration. It's the best way to purify your water. Unlike reverse osmosis or dist distillation, the ProPure filters don't eliminate the beneficial minerals that are found naturally in the water. Something you can do to help the operation and to take some control over your life because there's only so much you can do to get these arrogant bureaucrats. You, know, you can't get them to stop spending massive amounts of money to take the waste from the aluminum and nuclear industry, the, the fluoride, and start dumping it into your water. Even if you believe that that is beneficial and there's much, much science to show that it isn't, to show that it increases bone cancer and other illnesses, even if you believed that it was effective, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to mass medicate a population by putting stuff in the water supply. You're always going to get people that are under medicated or over medicated, even if it were effective and it's not effective. But we were talking to Dr. William Pepper and he's defended... Sirhan Sirhan, trying to get him another trial, trying to get it reopened based on new evidence that surfaced in 2004 about audio recordings that showed that there were multiple guns and that there were 13 shots fired. And talking about how there was even physical evidence of these shots in the ceiling. It was upward shots, shot from behind, that actually killed Robert Kennedy. 
and Sirhan Sirhan was in front, and he was actually maintains that he did not know where he was. He didn't know that he had shot Sirhan Sirhan uh, had shot uh, Robert Kennedy. He was told that he had, and believed it based on what he had been told. Sounds very similar to the shooting that we had in Aurora, Colorado. And there's a lot to be done in terms of educating the public as to what the CIA has been doing. We had some revelations of the church committee hearings in the 1970s where the CIA confessed to quite a bit of things that was news to the general public that had been talked about by other people. And we know that for at least 60 years, the government has been making a science out of mind control. That's something that the general public just doesn't understand yet. And we have a documentary that's coming out that uh, you can pre-book right now at InfoWarsStore.com, Mind Control. It's about the psychology of mind control and what's been done in these programs over the last several decades. Dr. Pepper, we were just talking about the new trial that you're getting involved in. Tell us a little bit about that, and we've got a couple of more minutes. Tell us uh, where you want to try to take that. You said you're trying to get that case reopened and actually, I guess, trying to do a prosecution based on the evidence that you've got there. Is that correct? Well, I, I think um, we're exploring uh, all of the uh, all of the possible uh, avenues. The whole idea is to is to get a judicial setting, whether it's civil or criminal, mm -hmm. where the evidence that um, Peter Janney has has, uh, has dug up and others have, uh, have have dug up as well. Now you can watch the Infowars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at infowars.com forward slash show.